embark on a journey of inspiration and discovery with the Purdue Lecture Hall Series, proudly presented by the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Diseases. Join us as we delve into the remarkable odysseys of these aspiring scientists, each crafting their own narrative in the world of science and groundbreaking research. Take a glimpse into their diverse cultural backgrounds and the journeys that brought them to Purdue University. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Welcome everybody to another Purdue Lecture Hall series. My name is Tommy Source. I'm Director of Scientific Strategy and Relations of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology and Infectious Disease. And today I have the pleasure of welcoming Ruth Aniaeche, who received her Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry from Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. She joined Hilka Ikentema's research group in 2019 at Purdue University and is pursuing her PhD in analytical chemistry. Her research involves the development of mass spectrometry methods for the fast identification of functional groups in unknown analytes and complex mixtures, coupling machine learning with tandem mass spectrometry based on a diagnostic ion molecule reactions to automate HPLC MS experiments synthesizing radical precursors to study their gas phase reactivities and exploring quantum chemical calculations. Welcome, Ruth. Welcome, welcome to the program. And thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today and telling us all about your journey into science. This wonderful, wonderful research that you're doing sounds pretty complex, too. And I hope you can explain some of it to us today. So thank you for being on the program. Thank you, Dr. So. Oh, that's very kind of you. And I'm happy to be here, too. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Perfect. Perfect. And I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to mute myself and turn myself off, off so that you take the spotlight. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you again, Dr. So, for this um, opportunity. I'm very, very happy to be here. So I've titled my presentation, Elucidating Structural Information of Unknown Compounds. My name is Ruth, and I do this work in Hilka Kentama's lab. But before I dive in, I kind of want you to know about myself. So my name is Ruth. And um, I'm going to briefly talk about my upbringing and my early childhood. And then I kind of want to talk about my early education or like my college education. And then I want to talk about how I got to Purdue and what I'm currently doing here in Hilka Kentama's lab. So I was born and raised in Nigeria and Nigeria is a country in Africa located mostly towards the western part of Africa. It's just right above the Gulf of Guinea. And um, if you kind of zoom into Nigeria, you begin to see different states. We have about 36 states and Abuja being the Abuja being the capital. I kind of I mainly grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. This region alone has about 20 million people. And um, I was born in Ondo State. I was born in Ondo State over here. So I've been around this area for the majority of my childhood. So I kind of also want to talk about what is Nigeria and how what is Nigeria known for? So Nigeria is known for the giant of Africa. And I'm going to talk about the reasons why um, we call ourselves the giant of Africa. So here is the map of Nigeria. It's a very simple map. It's two colors, green and white. So the green symbolizes the country's wealth. And then we have the white, which symbolizes peace and unity. And this is kind of a picture um, of Nigeria. It's very populated. We have about 200 million people. And I'm showing this picture just to give you like a pictorial or like a picture format of how populated it is. And because of the 
population, we have different types of languages and diversities. We have over 525 native languages. English are still being our main um, spoken language. We also have the first Black African Nobel laureate, Wole Shoinka, um, in house in Nigeria. And then we also have the richest man in Africa, also from Nigeria, Aligo Dangote. And then we have the largest oil producing and gas um, company in Nigeria. And so this is why we kind of call ourselves the giant of Africa, because everything is, everything is all situated in Nigeria. Besides that, Nigeria is a very beautiful place to visit. We have um, <clears throat> beautiful waterfalls, beautiful sites to go and visit. So when you get a time to travel, make sure you come to Nigeria. Okay, so because we are so populated, we have so many languages, then we have rich cultures. You can see here we have um, a masquerade festival um, to, the, to the top left. And then here is a girl getting married in different, um, wearing different um, attires. And we have like carnivals and beautiful, colorful um, carnivals. We have yam festivals, we have different festivals. So it's a very beautiful place to go and visit. We also have the best Nigerian jollof. So our food is impeccable. We have the normal, uh, we have the Nigerian jollof. A lot of African continent usually fight for who has the best jollof rice, but I would say we do. And then we have like dishes mainly around like a uh, soup, soup like dish. So we have um, egusi, we have ogona, we have different types of delicious meal. I think you would like to try when you get to Nigeria. So um, enough about that. I kind of want to go into um, start talking about you know my high school education and what uh, what my my career path was. So I went to a Nigerian. I went to like a military school. It's called Nigerian Navy Secondary School, and this is a picture showing like um, the entrance. So once you walk through the gate, this is the first thing you'd see. And my class is like kind of over here. It's funny looking back at this picture. I was like, oh my God, it's been such a long time. Time flies. And so um, so I put this picture here because when I was in high school, I really didn't know what I want to do. But I knew what I was currently doing. I wanted to do it very well. I kind of want to thank my chemistry teacher and then my physics teacher, Mrs. Ali and Mr. Owolabi. They were very helpful during my high school um, journey. Um, here I'm putting that it's okay not to have a clear idea of what you want to do. It's fine. In high school, nobody really expects you to know what you want to do. But as long as you put your best in whatever thing you, you're currently doing, I think that's, that's a very good thing to do. So the next thing is still not knowing what I want to do, I traveled over 6,000 miles to the United States to start my undergraduate degree. So it took me about almost 12 hours getting to the United States, flew across the North Atlantic Ocean. So I majored in chemistry because um, I kind of found a passion um, in the laboratory, like doing lab work when I was taking general chemistry classes, organic chemistry classes. So I went to Fisk for my undergraduate degree. So Fisk is located in Nashville, Tennessee. It was founded in 1866. And if we're wondering, it's a historical black colleges and university. And here I'm showing a picture of my chemistry department. This is where I spent most time um, doing research, um, learning, being more curious about, you know, things that you can do in life. And so, Flying across the ocean, um, nobody ever told me that it was going to be so cold. So here is the, the picture of my first semester when it began to snow. You can you can tell that the snow was, the snow was very uh, little, but I was freezing. But still, that didn't let that didn't stop me in going to classes or um, trying to learn what I need to learn. And I kind of want to put this here because. Um, you would have some set, um, setbacks and challenges, but you have to be able to face it head on. 
So this is kind of like an advice, um, you know, given to high school students or undergraduate students um, trying to find their path or their, um, their career path as they go through stages of life. So um, during my college degree, I had the opportunity to intern at different universities. And the reason why I was doing this is because I really wanted to gain more practical skills in terms of technical skills and soft skills. So in my first summer, I went to Colorado School of Mines and I worked with, I worked under the um, mentorship of Dr. Andrew Herrin. And here we're trying to study different uh, immobilization and cross-linking of polymers so that we can use it for fuel cells. So here I was trying to maximize the attachment of heteroplurine acid in a, in a polymer backbone. And my next summer, which is my second summer, was um, working with Dr. Neil in University of Cincinnati. Here I was looking at the investigation in the effect of different molecular weights on polymer blood compatibility. Here, I was trying to synthesize and also characterize different sugar pendants. You can see here that my first and my second internship were kind of different. The College of the Colorado School of Mines was more um, energy based, and the University of Cincinnati was um, more chemistry focused. And it's okay if you don't know what you want to do. And I kind of want to do this because I wanted to see what I like. Do I like more uh, engineering stuff or energy stuff or fuel cell stuff? Or do I like um, synthesizing stuff? And not only did I gain practical skills like knowing how to um, run a TLC, which is a thin layer chromatography, I also got the opportunity to even present my research. So here again in um, communication skills, talking to people, interacting, interacting with people. Um, my third internship was at Mich Michigan State University. Here I worked under Dr. Lee. And for this project, we we're primarily trying to separate um, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, I worked with Dr. Catherine Ruren. And we we're trying to study the relationship of preamyloid oligomers um, with atrial fibrillation. Again, I got a very exciting opportunity to present my research at a conference. And here, if you're trying to seek, um, if you're trying to seek opportunities to, um, you know, do internships over the summer, you have various, various, various. Um, platform you can do that. We have the REU, which is the re um the research for um which is research experience for undergraduate um students, and we have different types of platform platform available for students really seeking to spend more time in the lab. I will kind of want to um give acknowledge to whom acknowledge is due. I kind of I want to thank Dr. Kent Wallace, my physics teacher, um Dr. Natalie. Arnett, who was my chemistry um, professor at Fisk, Dr. Sanjay, my computer science um, professor, and then Dr. Steven Damo. They were really, really helpful and they were instrument um, in supporting me throughout my journey in college, especially since, um, coming from a different country. Now, the next thing is that I gained my BS in chemistry from Fisk, and then I started and back in on a journey to become a boiler maker. The distance of travel wasn't as far as um, coming from Africa, but I still got closer to the code, although I didn't really like it, but my path was just taking me closer and closer um, to, to where the codes were. But that's why I put this picture here because um, I really wanted to gain the best knowledge as possible. And that's why I moved over to, um, to be boiler maker. And when I got to Purdue, I joined the amazing lab, Hilke Kentima's lab. And these are lab, these are my wonderful lab mates. And um, and there are different reasons why I joined Hilke Kentima's lab. But one of the reasons I kind of want to highlight is if you're trying to um pick an advisor or pick a lab to work at or to work in, 
a supportive mentorship and a positive work environment is very, very important. Picking an advisor who really cares about your mental health, who supports you in anything that you want to do is very important in picking an advisor and also picking a lab as a graduate student. So now I kind of want to shift gear and talk about what I do in Hilka Kentama's lab. So as you know, oh, I don't know if you know, but uh, mass spec is a very essential analytical tool that most analytical chemists use. And one of the main significance is that it helps to, um, it helps for compound identification. It helps to identify compounds or anything in your sample. It's, it has very high sensitivity. That's why most analytical chemists really use it. And then it's very versatile. It can be used in any field, in protein, mix, um, food science, mention it. And then the last thing is that it's very accurate and it's very efficient. So now that we know the, uh, the importance of mass spec, I kind of want to talk about um, a very simple basic principle of mass spectrometry. So if you have your sample over here, your sample gets ionized. And after ionization, it separates based on what we call mass to charge ratio. And then it's then detected, and then you see the display on your computer or any system that you're using. And I want to show you a video of a real-time um, ionization that is done in the ion trap or in using mass spec. And here, this video was gotten from the official website, so I kind of want to acknowledge them for that. It gives a very explanatory um, vision um, picture of what you see in um or what, how you ionize this ionize your sample So Ruth, we are not hearing anything on the video if they're explaining anything in particular. I don't know if you want to explain as we go along. They are not explaining anything, so that's very good. So it's just showing like um, the movement of eyes. So over here, you have like the ions being trapped in the, in the ion chart and then they are moved for detection. So the ions begin to get detected and they go through like a slit on the x-axis. Then you can see that here, ions being detected by the detection. So here is what we call MSMS analysis. So this is where you isolate ions, like an ion with a particular ion with a Z charge. And to do that, you have to excite the unwanted ions. So over here in the high pressure cell, that's what's happening. So we are removing all the unwanted ions and we want to only isolate the ions of interest. So now the ions of interest have been ionized the blue color thing you see in the trap are just helium. So the helium helps the ions to um, convert their kinetic energy to internal energy, and then they begin to fragment. So here you will see that ions be began to fragment and then they are detected. So this is how um, a simple basic way of doing um, the mass spectrometry analysis or experiments. So the same things are detected, and you should be able to see that on whatever display or system that you're using. Okay, so that was very beautiful. Um, they did a lot of the explanation for me. And this is kind of like a picture of a mass spec. It's like a box, but it's a very, very powerful box. Uh, and because of that, I kind of want to give an advice to high schoolers or to undergrads or to younger generation or younger scientists, 
that you can you can be incredible, but you can also be incredible because just as how mass spec identifies unique ions, you can actually embrace your individuality and um and quality that would make you stand out. So moving on, um, so what I would like to talk about is how mass spec itself has some limitations. And that's why we've developed a method called iron molecule reaction that can um that is more powerful than doing a simple CAD, which is collision activated dissociation. And here is an example of what I'm showing. So here is a um, an isomeric metabolite, an isomeric ions. They have the same molecular weight. So the molecular weight for the one on top is um, 582, and the one at the bottom is 582. Now, I'm doing a simple MSMS. MSMS means you deprotonate or you protonate your ions. In this case, I'm deprotonated, deprotonating it. It collides with helium, and then it converts the kinetic energy of the ions into internal energy, and then the bonds begins to fragment over here. And we do this because we want to gain structural information of what our analyte is. But in some cases, doing this cannot really tell us anything. It cannot really differentiate what we want to um what we want to differentiate or what we want to study. And here is an example of having the same isomeric ions. And via CAD, we are getting the same M over Z mass to charge ratio, or in other words, we're getting the same numbers. We have 519 and we have 519 over here. We have 447, we have 447 over here. Not only are they the same, their relative abundance as well is very similar. You can tell that the ratio between this and that or this and this is kind of very similar. So it becomes hard for us to differentiate isomeric ions or um, differentiate even functional groups. And so um, what we now did in our lab is that we tried to modify the mass spec or um, the mass spectrometer. So here is a commercial a picture or a schematic of a commercially available iron trap, like I showed in the picture. But what I want to draw your attention to is how we've kind of slightly mod modified the, a commercially available iron trap so that we can have a secondary introduction of our reagents. So here we have a reagent going in directly into the iron trap. And then we have our analytes coming in from the front of the mass spec. And then they will react and collide, just like how you saw in the video, it was colliding with helium. But in this case, our molecules are going to be our reagents and they're going to collide. And that's going to give us a reaction product. And that can tell us different information, even more information um, on what our analytes or what our compound is. So let's go back to the example that I showed before, where we have O-glucronides and N-glucronides, the same molecular weight, isomeric ions. But here, I kind of want to draw your attention to how different the mass spectrum is. So here is, again, our deprotonated um, M over Z. And you see the products are kind of different. There is 617, but the 617 is like really very small over there. There's 607, you could barely see. There's no, you could barely see any 607. There is no 607 in the top mass spectrum. There's 643, 643 can be found in the upper um, spectrum. And so this is actually a way we can use a mass spec to our advantage. So not only can they differentiate isomeric ions, you can tell that. Um, the relative abundance are also different if we have a, if we have similar M over Zs. So this is very important for us. And in Helka Kentama's lab, we've developed tons and tons and tons of methods that can help us differentiate functional groups. And here I'm showing a table that has um, reagents on top. And then we have functional groups on the left-hand side. And where you see X, it means that that specific reagent 
is very diagnostic or you can have a reaction product to a particular functional group. So for TMB, which I'll talk about later, you see an X in a functional group called sulfone. So this means that when you react these two together, you're gonna have like a diagnostic functional, a diagnostic product, which is specific for that functional group. And this is just an example of the library that we have. But the thing is that the same thing can be applied to aziridins. Now, aziridin functional group are very similar to, um, let's say, amine or amide. And here we're trying to differentiate aziridin functional groups from structurally related functionalities. So here is a protein, a picture of um, two benzyl as aziridin. And I'm showing that upon CAD, remember it's the collision of helium, and then bonds begins to fragment, and then you produce structural information. So upon CAD, you'd see that we have a loss of 17. But the loss of 17 can also be seen in another functionality, which is diphenylamine. You see that loss of 17. You can also see that in amide. So this becomes very hard for scientists or pharmaceutical companies to tell apart functional groups from one another. And what we've done is we've actually done this work and we've published it in the Journal of Organic Chemistry, um, telling ways and methods we can um, differentiate from as reading functionalities from other structurally related functional groups. And um, as I've mentioned, um, we kind of slightly modified um, the mass spec so that we can allow the introduction of neutral reagents. So here is a schematic of what we currently have in the lab, where we have um, something I like to call the nine pulse valve. So the nine pulse valve, as the name would suggest, is having nine different inlet um, systems where you can introduce up to nine different neutral reagents for a fast screening or fast identification of functional groups. So this is situated just close to the iron trap so that once we pause this reagent in, it goes directly from the back plate of the instrument straight into the iron trap where it reacts with our, where it reacts with our, um, with our analyte. So because we have nine um, pulse valve, we can have up to nine different neutral reagents. And here I kind of uh, put three neutral reagents in red because like the table I showed you before, this is the mostly studied um, neutral reagent in the lab. So here we have TMB, TDMAP, and MOP. These are the ones that were highlighted in red in the previous slide. And here you can clearly tell that this neutral reagents are playing a very important role in identifying functional groups. And so what we did is we kind of want to start um, using a machine learning to help us um, plan our experimental procedure. Now, because we are using up to, up to nine different neutral reagents, the interpretation of our experimental data becomes complicated or becomes time consuming. Selecting one neutral reagent to use can also be very challenging, again, because we have tons and tons of neutral reagents. And um, something that requires us to do is something called optimization. We have to optimize each pulse valve to make sure that uh, we can have a fast identification of neutral reagents. And to do that, we have to use machine learning. We have to automate all of this. We have to automate the identification of functionalities. We also have to automate the selection of neutral reagents. And then finally, automate the optimization of this pulse valve. And why do we want to use machine learning? The reason that we want to use machine learning is that it's gonna, which is very, it's a very obvious thing. It's gonna save us time. 
it's going to reduce the amount of resources to use. So if you try one re reagent, it doesn't work. We try another one. These are all resources. And it's going to eventually save us money. It's going to help us identify unknown impurity, improve our accuracy, and also start predicting nutrient reagents that we can use. And I kind of want to stop here and summarize the overall project of using machine learning and the use of machine learning is in collaboration with Dr. Chopra Garav. Um, what we're trying to do here, what we've already done is that we're trying to exclude human interaction. So here we had originally four human interaction inputs, but with machine learning, we've kind of removed um, three human interaction where we can actually um, just humans can ultimately just design, design the experiment and then go home and go sleep and everything will just run for, for, for ourselves. So it's a very um, broad, broad topic or broad, um, what, what would I say, broad innovation. But in the long run, we've been, able, we've been able to identify functionalities using machine learning or specifically a decision tree this is decision tree based um, model and also help us predicting selections of new um, nutrient reagents. And with that, I would like to thank my um, PI, Hilka Kentama. I want to thank my committee members, Dr. Angeline Lyon, Dr. Mark Limpton, and Dr. Scott McClarkey. I also want to thank my lovely lab members, um, which shown this are the pictures of our recent um, lab members some of them have graduated but I would really like to thank them because of how it's very nice to work with them and department of chemistry and our funding but before I conclude I kind of want to give like an advice although I've been giving advice throughout my slides I kind of want to like just take a slide and just explain more on like the things I've learned in the past and things that things I wish I kind of knew. And the first one is something I kind of already said. Um, it's good for you to embrace your individuality and quality that makes you stand out. Um, be iron credible. Um, your network is your net worth because um the people you know are gonna vouch for you. The internship that I did are they're still writing letters of recommendation for me. So make sure you keep um, growing your network, growing your personal and your professional um, career. And I kind of, because I'm a mass spectrometrist, um, my advice are gonna be based off of a mass spec. Um, it's also, uh, one advice I also wanna give is balance your peak um, because you have to find balance in life and, um, prioritize work and your personal life and just try to balance it. And then um, fragmentation can be beautiful. So although there are like different challenges and setbacks that you will have throughout your career journey, that is usually not a bad thing. It can help you grow and you can have a beautiful outcome and have a beautiful story. And then lastly, you have all it takes to succeed. Always believe in yourself, you've got this, and the sky is just your starting point. It's not your limit. And then with that, I'd like to thank you guys for your attention. And um, again, I'm very happy to be here. Awesome, Ruth. This is so great. And I love that concluding slide with all of the tips and suggestions uh, because they are all so great. Uh, and such great points to put across there. Um, I wonder if you can take us back a little bit and okay. and it take us to like, what was it that was being around the lab that you really liked that you said, well, I really wanted to get into chemistry because I love being around the lab. And so what okay. was what was that like? So I got to, so throughout my internship experience, I kind of worked in different aspects of chemistry. 
you know, I did analytical, I did organic, I did the one at um, MSU was pharmacology. So I kind of tried different things to figure out what I really enjoy. And to be truthful with you, all of those um, parts of organic chemistry all ties down to analytical chemistry because they have tools to figure out, oh, did I synthesize this well? Or tools for biological applications. They, it's all on the analytical chemistry. So when I kind of found out that, yes, there are different um, aspects to chemistry, we have the people who synthesize stuff, we have people who do biological analysis for therapeutic drugs um, discovery, there are people whose um, job is just to develop methods to help this um, incredible scientist to do. So having that experience kind of solidified my decision on what I want to do. When I decided it was analytical chemistry, I brought on my computer. I was like, I'm going to apply to graduate school and where, what other place to be than to be, than to be in the best analytical chemistry program in the, in the U S. So I was very, very fortunate to have, um, been part of, um, Purdue and precisely Hilke Kentum's lab. Yeah. That's awesome. And I I want to also uh, maybe get you to tell us a little bit. You you said there was much excitement coming from Nigeria across and uh, landing in the U.S. Was it a little scary, too? <laughs> yeah, I was scared. Actually, at the plane, I was so sick. I was like, I'm leaving my mom. I'm leaving my dad. I'm leaving my family. Yeah, And I'm going yeah. to... A, a different country so I was very scared of course but I didn't let that stop me because I didn't know what I want to do but I knew that I wanted to aspire to be more so I was very curious I was very uh, I didn't mind going across uh, across another continent just to get that experience so it was very challenging um, the cold for sure was very was very brutal. Although people were like, oh, that's a very tiny snow. You'd be fine. Like in Nigeria, we only have one weather, hot. <laughs> so it was very, it was it was very different. But again, it was a challenge that I had to stand up to. And because of that, um, I've grown from it. Yeah, I can imagine you've grown a lot from that. And maybe you can sit, tell us, was it was it worse in your mind than what it really was in terms of the scariness, the challenges? Because I, I always tend to think, well, we tend to picture it much worse in our mind than once we started was like, ah, it's not so bad. Uh, so what was it for you? Yeah, I think that's a very good question because a lot of times we are on limitation, right? So it was very scary for me. But when I go here, people were so helpful. They were so nice. At the, For example, at the airport, I was trying to, because the place I landed wasn't where I was going to, because you have to land at a, a U.S., pass through the immigration, and not all yes. airports have that. So I landed, but I didn't know how to connect to my connection flight. And I was stranded at the airport and a very nice lady came up to me. I was like, do you need help? I was like, yes, please. This is my connection. Do you know where I can go? And just that's just an example of how nice people were. Um, I can, like another lady really helped me because I was... I didn't know how to use the phone at the airport and she was so generous to like you know help me use the phone so I can communicate with my parents that oh I've landed safely don't worry about me and things like that so that's just one of the many 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 things that um I didn't know about that people are very nice over here so yeah yeah it was way better than what I'd imagined that's awesome. And and I I kind of tend to think that the environment that you're in with Dr. Kentama's lab in chemistry, that you're getting a similar type of helpful environment by your colleagues, your classmates, the people that are around you. Tell us a little bit about, Again, how scary is it to come into a lab like that where you know, my gosh, all these people are doing such great work 
must be a little intimidating, but then what is it like? Is it, are they very helpful? Do you need to be asking or do people come up to you? What's it, what's the atmosphere like? I would say that um, there are two different stages. So you have the PI, Hilka Kemptema, and then you have the people you work with. So um, for my PI, she's very, I love her. She's very, very nice. She's very supportive. Whatever you want to do, just tell her. She, All she has to do is just be there and support and write letters of recommendations and send you out to conferences and things like that. So, and she's also very key on mental health because as a grad student, you would um, get to your low point and you want someone who is very supportive and very understanding to help you um, through it. So um, that's also one of the reasons I joined a lab because mental health is very important. And then as to the work environment, our fellow colleagues or like my fellow colleagues or our fellow graduate students or even undergrads, we're all nice, we're all friendly. When I newly got to Purdue, I didn't know what a mass spec was. I was like, what is it? It's a box. So, so what? So, but like, um, I got to really learn and learn the principle, learn the fundamental, learn the theory. And it was all thanks to the people I work with and my PI. So it's okay not to know what you want to do, but as long as you're passionate and you're curious about it, I think that's already like a, a higher platform to begin with. Uh, that's right. And I think having the resolve to say, you know, I promised myself I'm not going to I'm not going to stop trying. Uh, oh. You might you might never become uh, Hilka Kentama in her abilities. Right. And her and she and, and and you know her 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 science and 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 knowledge in in mass spectrometry but that you if that's what you want to aspire to if you want to aspire to become a mass spectrometrist and you want to learn the fundamentals you just have to keep trying and like anything we all we all eventually become what we keep trying to become mm -hmm. that's great that's really great yeah. Ruth and I I really liked I really liked the way that you uh, presented mass spectrometry. I I love the video. I thought I thought it was it was really uh, poignant. What um what what does it look like for you next? Once you're done your PhD, what do you want to keep doing, or what do you want to do next? Um, like I said, I don't know what I want to do next, but I know that um, I want to I want to continue to learn and grow. So um, I want to be able to be an independent scientist, learn how to think critically, be a problem solver. I don't know if there's a job for that, but that's what I want to do. So if I'm a scientist, then I want to use those skills that I've learned to be impactful in solving the real world problem or um, just being helpful and being an instrument in being, um, in being a scientist. So I would say that um, I'll be graduating very soon in November. So nice. uh, after that, I would, um, I got I, I got a job offer at Corteva. Oh, nice. So it's gonna be a very nice, thank you, thank you. It's gonna be a very nice, um, experience for me so I'm very excited about that I want to learn more about agricultural science I want to learn more about what we can do what is out there because as you've seen I've, I've been in school all my life right I didn't take a year gap or anything but I've been I've been very curious to see what's out there and this is going to be a platform to start that to grow my network and and all the advice that I gave, I'm actually even using it. So it's very um important to um to always to always do that, to always grow your network and to always learn. I I think that's so true. And you can tell by your conviction in the way that you are relating some of these tips is that you are living those tips and you are following your own guidance. Um it, I, you know, mass spectrometry and chemistry and your background, 
if somebody wanted to go into this area, if somebody wanted to work in a lab like how you're doing, what should they be doing to prepare for it? Maybe what kind of courses should they take or how can they get involved? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, I would say to get involved is re reach out to people. People are actually nicer than you think. So reach out to people, tell them like what you're interested in. Um, tell them that, oh, I want to be in Hilka Kenton's lab. What can I do? And then they kind of like um, tell you what you need to do. Or I want to be this. They'll tell you what you need to do. I would say finding a mentor that that kind of understands what your journey or what you like or what you want to do is also very vital. Um, so just ask, asking people, reaching out to people, go on LinkedIn, look for, if you want to join Hiroka Kentama's lab, look for their current members and, you know, email them. We have our emails on the website or go to LinkedIn, connect with us and things like that. So it's fine if you don't know, because I didn't know. But with my internship experience, I had to start, you know, oh, okay, this is how it is done. Oh, okay, this is how we should do it. So it's 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 nice to always network and nobody no, I don't think anyone out there would say no if you if 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 they want to be helpful. Hey, I think that is so important, Ruth, what you just said, uh, because I want everybody to hear that loud and clear. <laughs> That if you ask for help, many, many people are ready to help you because it's very fulfilling to do that. Um, yeah. Ruth Aniaeche, uh, P almost PhD candidate, almost PhD. Hopefully, uh, we we get to speak to you next in next November, and uh, we'll be calling you Doctor Aniaeche. Uh, oh, oh boy, yeah. And I hope it all goes well. Thank you so much uh, for taking time to tell us about your journey, to tell us about this wonderful work that you're doing and so many great tips, so many uh, outstanding uh, pieces of advice. So okay. thank you, Ruth. It's been a pleasure yeah. uh, getting to hear your talk and it's been a pleasure uh, to have you on the program. Oh, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. This is a very good platform um, to showcase and to, to, to encourage younger scientists um, in aspiring to be anything they want to be. So yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, I would I would be I'll be glad to hear from you in November. Absolutely. Well thank you for those kind words and I hope you have a great day. All right, you too. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.